<laughs> Listen, y'all, I am so excited. Thank y'all for coming back to the Eat Me podcast. This is Alicia. And I'm really excited because today I have Dr. Lucy on the podcast. And it's so funny because Dr. Lucy and I are just meeting for the first time. And I'm loving that. So thank you so much for being here on the podcast, Dr. Lucy. But I'm really excited because today Dr. Lucy is here to talk to us about one thing that I know I'm go I'm actually approaching and probably in on the cusp of it, which is menopause. And initially we were going to talk about a whole different topic, but when I realized like menopause was her thing, I was like, girl, get it together. You need to talk to Dr. Lucy about it because one, you're you're possibly, you know, at, you know, any moment going through that. And two, it I know my listeners, many of my listeners are also either going through menopause, have been through menopause and probably need just some guidance around how to manage um yourself as it relates to menopause. So Dr. Lucy, thank you so much for being here on the podcast. I am so excited for this conversation. Oh, Alicia, you're welcome. It's my honor to be on. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So if you could just let us know, Dr. Lucy, in terms of your specialty of practice, do you mm. solely focus on what's called like considered like a metabolic type of care or uh, what is your actual specialty? Yeah, so I so I'm a medical doctor in Australia. Uh we don't use the term MD as much as as you do in America, but MD and uh -huh. um and I originally did family physician training, so I was a family general practitioner for a long long time and then moved into yes, metabolic health uh and lifestyle medicine physician training I did. So I and part of it was that I I got I, I sort of did some reflection on my general practice years and realized that you know, from the time I started to, you know, 25 years later, people were getting sicker and mm -hmm. sicker and I was just prescribing more and more medications. And I just thought, this is, this is nuts. Like people, are, you know, people work hard all their lives. They work so hard. They get to retirement. They're on, you know, 42 different meds, needing to go to specialists, specialist after specialist. And they just, they don't get to enjoy their retirement. They don't get to enjoy their life. So, Getting into lifestyle medicine training and addressing the root cause of, of I guess, aging health was my original impetus. And then over the years, I just, you know, started working with more and more women. And, you know, every woman goes through menopause. So I thought, okay, we've got to, we've got to help, we've got to help people who are going through and when you're going through it, it's called perimenopause. And then it's interesting because menopause, menopause is just, it's one day of the year. It's one day of your life, actually. Hmm. But the, the definition of menopause is when you're 12 months past your very last period. So it's like the anniversary of that day, then suddenly you're menopausal. But up until all of then, you're perimenopausal. And then once you've passed menopausal, your postmenopausal, so it's kind of weird. Okay, first of all, I feel like completely like embarrassed in a way, but I'm actually excited that that you've like actually broken this down in this way. Obviously, I work on the pediatric side of everything, yeah. so I'm, I'm not into all of this, but I'm still a woman. I'm like, how did I not know this? So basically. As you're going through, so people having like the, the sweating and all the mood swings, all that. So that's considered perimenopausal. Indeed. Yes. Yes. So, and there's, it's, wow. it's great because there is a lot more um, talk about it now. In fact, people call it peri. I'm, I'm peri. So yeah, perimenopause. And the average time of perimenopause is, is three to four years, but it can be up to 10. Oh so women can start getting these symptoms. And the symptom people, you know, most people will know about, yeah, hot hot flushes. We call them hot flushes in Australia, but you call yeah. them hot flashes, uh -huh. uh, you know, night sweats. People know about those. But there's all these other symptoms that can come with it, including things like dry skin, dry hair, itchy skin, um, brain fog. As you said, mood swings are so irritable, like so irritable. Things set you off that you think, oh, my God, what is going on? So right. it's not so much, you know, like sadness or blues, but, yeah, just this intense nappiness. So, um, yeah, it's full on. It is full on. And so when someone is actually um, 
so I'm like I shared with you earlier, I'll be 46 on Friday. And yeah. so for people like me that are like, okay, am I going through or am I perimenopausal? What would be something that would be like, oh, yeah. Th yeah. These are some of the signs that are showing that you are perimenopausal. So I guess the first thing to note is that 20% of women will have no symptoms. They just cruise mm. through. So you know when you hear those people going, oh, I didn't have anything, you're thinking, yeah, right. Yeah, 20% of people get nothing. So, you know, hooray for them. 80% of women, therefore, will get some symptoms. Again, the classic is going to be a thermo, it's, you know, we call it thermoregulation, but hot, hot flashes, night sweats. And the other one is sleep, sleep disturbance. So, you know, you might have always been a great sleeper, and this was my hallmark because I am. I used to bang on, oh, my superpower is sleeping. I can sleep through anything, and I honestly could. And now, three o'clock in the morning, I'm looking up at the ceiling thinking, well, this is ridiculous. Um, so, yeah, just suddenly you can go from being a brilliant sleeper to not so good. And interestingly, some anxiety symptoms, some people will wake up with them. Having never had anxiety in their entire life with nothing to feel anxious about, they just wake up with this feeling like a bit of anxiety in the pit of your stomach and you're thinking, what's going on here? So it, it often takes a little, well, A, someone to tell you that the, this could be perimenopause, um, but B, just a bit of time to think, oh, this isn't just a one-off, this is, this is going. So, yeah, there, there are lots of the symptoms. Yeah, and, and in particular, brain fog. It's so bloody annoying um, yes. that you go, I, I just can't remember things easily like I used to be able to remember them. You know, that's so interesting that you, you're bringing up the whole thing around like brain fog and memory because I am experiencing that like in yeah. real time. And it's so funny because my daughter and my wife always laugh at me about it because they're like, yeah, you're not going to remember this. And that's like now the running joke. Like I literally am just like, I mean, I guess. So maybe, yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. I know. I know. You turn into Dory and you just think, oh my God, I can't remember anything. So yeah, it is. And it's frustrating. And the thing with Perry is that it can come and go a bit. So the mm. whole thing with perimenopause is your ovaries are still working just not all the time so you get this sort of intermittent symptoms where you're thinking oh no no I don't have and so you, you end up sort of almost gaslighting yourself because you're thinking no I'm not going through med I'm fine now it's fine for a couple of weeks and now I'm back so you get yeah really intermittent symptoms mm. and so when it comes to just like your menstrual flow mm. you're, so that's basically what you're saying like kind of like maybe like one month it's how it normally is. And then, then it's kind of like blotchy. And or, are people like typically like skipping menses or is it just kind of irregular? So a bit of, it can be either. And this is the whole thing. It can be anything. You can actually still have symptoms and have completely regular periods, which is the other annoying thing. Um, but for the majority of people, they, they might skip a period here or there, or it might start to become heavier. That's the other thing that happens is that have periods become heavier before you, before they stop you're kind of going oh wouldn't mind a bit of relief now so yeah it, it's a whole heap of lots of things mm -hmm. the things that I specifically like to talk about because everyone knows about hot flushes like every, you know most people know that but the things that I specifically like to talk about are um, weight gain too. So people do, they gain weight around the middle and they're thinking, I haven't changed my eating. I'm, but now I'm, you know, I, my, my, my genes don't fit. It's very annoying. Uh, weight gain, mood changes and energy. So you get tired. That's the other thing that happens. They're just, you're thinking, I'm just not like I used to be. Mm. And that's that, that, like, literally I'm just like, yep, check, check, check. Cause even yeah. down to the, like the midsection thing, like, I was trying to put on some clothes the other day and I was like, what is going on? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's me. I know. I know. <laughs> but the good news is there's stuff you can do about it. So it's, you know, it's not, it's, I think when we present the symptoms, it sounds terrible, like terrifying. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, this is so awful. So depressing. But I, it's important to present the symptoms so people know that this is perimenopause, that mm. they're not. And because some people think they, they, they've got like a psychiatric condition or they need, you know, so, antidepressants or something. It's not. Um, 
But so, yeah, you can absolutely do things about it. That's the key. So, yeah, recognition, step one. Step two, oh, I can do something. Huzzah. Right. And so, you know, as, as you're saying, there's something you can do about it. Would diet be something that would play a part in actually like either like hormone regulation or, you know, whatever that looks like? Is that, is that something that plays a part? Could it be like a good or bad thing in this whole process? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the way I like to describe it is, again, letting people know why they're getting these symptoms. So we mm-hmm. get, I call it the, the you know, the, the metabolic triad of menopause. And so we have decreasing estrogen. So it's certainly fluctuating during that perimenopause, but ultimately it's decreasing. We have increasing cortisol levels and we have increasing insulin levels. So estrogen is, I mean, estrogen is such a great hormone for women. It is the best hormone ever. When you look at all its benefits, you think, oh my God, give me some estrogen. Because (laughs) it really, you know, when you look at all the things it does. So, you know, in our muscles, in our musculoskeletal system, it uh, improves collagen, it improves cartilage, it builds and repairs muscle, it's involved in tendons and uh, joints and ligaments. It has anti-inflammatory properties, so joint pain, that's another thing that comes with peri. Um, People don't realize they're suddenly getting, they just go, oh my God, I'm getting achy joints, I'm tired, I'm old. You feel old. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and estrogen's obviously super important in bone health, so people know about that. But there's bazillions of estrogen receptors in our brain. So Mm. this is where it's involved in our thermoregulation, it's involved in our sleep, it's neuroprotective, so oxidative stress is one of the causes of Alzheimer's disease, which is why I don't mind talking about that either, (laughs) Um, but estrogen is protective. And so it's got heaps of things that it does. And then as far as our metabolic health, estrogen improves our insulin sensitivity. So Hmm. in general, and I don't know if you've ever had anyone on your show talking about insulin resistance, but, you know, high circulating insulins, uh, sorry, high circulating insulin levels are the root cause of all of our chronic disease and metabolic health. So all the things related to type 2 diabetes, fatty liver disease, Alzheimer's, um, it's, you know, kidney failure, they're all related to high insulin. So estrogen protects us against that. Estrogen stops, you know, it helps us, it helps stop fat being deposited in our organs and it Mm. helps stop fat being deposited in uh, around our abdominal cavity. And so you go, oh God, I love estrogen. (laughs) Um, However, again, there's, there's one the one thing that estrogen is not so helpful for is if you have estrogen positive receptor breast cancer, mm, then estrogen's yeah. probably not your friend. But for all the rest of the women, estrogen is super helpful. So as we're going through peri and, and get to menopause, we we decrease estrogen, but we don't, it's not an absence. Like it's not that you have, you don't go from, you know, 100 down to zero. Mm-hmm. Half of our estrogen is made in the ovaries and then the rest is made in our adrenal glands and in our fat tissue. So skinny women will often have worse menopause symptoms mm. because they don't have very much fat tissue and fat the, it, fat makes a type of estrogen called estrone and it's a mild form of estrogen. So this is, and again, this is another another topic for another day, but the whole, uh, you know, you must be thin to be healthy is a tiny bit of bullshit. And that really, if, you know, anybody with a BMI under 30 is probably okay. Whereas, and so, you know, there's these people that go, oh, their BMI is 28, they're overweight. Honestly, it, you're still highly likely to be healthy. So anyway, that's another side issue. Um, the, so our adrenal gland is another little powerhouse of estrogen. And so we can optimize our own natural estrogen production by being kind to our 
adrenal gland. And the way we do that is to learn to manage our stress. So this is where the stress stuff comes in because when we're stressed and stressed for a lot of us is just busy and you described it perfectly your earlier before we started chatting, um, you know, working hard, burning the candle at both ends, approaching burnout, all of that means that your adrenal gland is on, is on, you know, it's, it's massively diverting everything towards making cortisol. Mm. So the adrenal gland makes lots, it does lots of jobs. It's another great organ. God, we've got great organs. But if you're diverting everything to making cortisol, then you don't have enough, if you like, ingredients to make much estrogen. So we call it the cortisol steal. And cortis- the more cortisol you produce, then the less estrogen you're going to produce. The less estrogen that you produce, the more anxious you feel, the more cortisol you produce. So it's this little cycle. And so these three hormones, are estrogen, insulin, and cortisol, because the higher your insulin, sorry, the higher your cortisol, the more insulin you produce. So it just gets this little cycle. So you reduce your estrogen, you produce more cortisol, you produce more insulin, you get, you know, uh, and the symptoms that we get from that are this tired you know, uh, again, weight gain around the middle and irritable because insulin's job is to store fat. That's one of its jobs. And so the more insulin we have, the and we store the fat around the middle. And then I guess, you know, just to kind of close it off, the when we have high circulating insulin and particularly when we can't store our fat or we can't access our fat stores, we have an energy issue. So we've got all this stored energy, which is all fat is. It's just stored energy, but we can't actually get it. So it's like, right, I'm storing like crazy, and then I can't get it out. It's like a term deposit that you can never get back again. (laughs) (laughs) And it's like, oh, so annoying. And so when we've got got an energy issue, we, we are obviously tired, but we also can't think because our brain needs energy to think. Mm. And so there's this whole hoo-ha going on that you can't think, you're tired, you're getting fatter. And so I call it the frumpy, grumpy and dumpy. You just. I love that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, that's what's going on. And so we feel like we're going crazy, but we're not. It's all physiological. It's not our fault. It is just happening and we can do something about it. And I, I love that you are bringing so much more hope around this. Because I, and I'm pretty sure you come across women like this where it's like, oh my gosh, I'm going, I'm, you know, in a stage of, you know, going through menopause or say, you know, whatever. Yeah. Everything is over for me. Right. Like, yeah. And everything's falling apart. And thank you for shedding light on this and breaking it down in a way where it's like, this is just a part of the process and you are not going crazy. You know, there are things to do. And so I thank you for that. Seriously. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. So I guess that moves on to, yeah, you know, to answer your question back to the diet, to what diet should we eat Mm -hmm. that it is, it's helpful. So I, I I have, uh, there's four things, four lifestyle um, things that we can do. And then for some women, they might want to consider HRT or as it's now called MHT. And so Mm -hmm. I can talk briefly about that as well. But the lifestyle stuff that we want to look at, so we're wanting to look at what can we do to reduce insulin levels uh, because they just will get higher and higher as we get older and older. Um, So certainly, you know, reducing sugar and starches. And I know people might be rolling their eyes as they're listening to this, but it has a profound effect on insulin levels. Mm. And so when we reduce our sugars and starches, our pancreas doesn't have to make as much insulin. If we make less insulin, then we can access our fat stores. So I have a little analogy around the fat store story. And I try and explain it to say, imagine that your body's like a house and you've got a fireplace to, you know, heat your house. Mm -hmm. So your fireplace is, you know, whenever anybody makes a fire, you would use some kindling, so little sticks and maybe some paper, 
And that's like glucose. So that's like our sugars. Mm. And so when we eat glucose or sugars, it's like a little energy burst. It's hot, but it dies down. So it dies down quickly. And then if you're really good at making fires, you would obviously you'd put the kindling on and then you'd put a few logs on for the, that slow burn. So the logs are, are basically fat and that's fat that we either eat or fat that's on our body. And so in somebody who has normal levels of insulin, their body is really good at just accessing glucose and fat and you can just power along. You've got plenty of energy and, you know, unless you've only had two hours sleep, you're not tired, you're thinking, well, everything works. But for lots of us, we don't have access to those logs and those logs are in what I like to call the woodshed. So the woodshed is your stored body fat. Mm. And if you have high levels of insulin, it's like having a lock on your woodshed. Wow. And for some people, they might just have one lock, but some people have 10 locks. Like so their insulin levels are so high. So people might be wondering, well, you know, is my woodshed locked? And I say to them, well, if, you've, if, if you're a woman and you've had polycystic ovarian syndrome, mm. then, then yeah, you're, you're probably going to have locks on your woodshed. If you've had a baby and you had gestational diabetes, then, yeah, you're probably going to have locks on your woodshed. If you've ever been diagnosed with fatty liver disease, and, and I, it used to drive me nuts because doctors would often say, oh, oh, it's just a touch of fatty liver. Touch of fatty liver is is insulin resistant and you're, you've got locks on your shed. Right. And so what we want to do is unlock the shed. We want to open it up so that you can burn your stored body fat. And the only way to do that is to reduce your insulin levels. And the most effective, easiest way to do that is to reduce your sugars and starches. So obviously sugar people know and starches are, are, are mainly the white things, you know, potato, right. bread, pasta, flour. Um, and so by doing that, you open your shed, you, you know, people, I love it. People always say to me, oh my God, Lucy, I've got so much energy now. I never realized I can do all the things. I could go play with the kids. I'm not falling asleep every afternoon. I don't need 55 lattes a day to keep going. Mm -hmm. It's so good. So yeah, so whole food, low sugar and starches, adding in healthy fats. So things like olive oil, avocados, nuts, you know, I, I'm a, a few years older than you, um, Alicia, but I grew up and you might have too in that low fat era yes. where, you know, breakfast for me was a dry bit of toast with some diet jam. It was so awful. <laughs> and <laughs> yes. And, you know, dinner was steak with all, all the fat chopped off it. So it was like an old bit of leather and a salad with vinegar on it. Heaven forbid. Right. You actually had, you know, there was no avocado, no nuts, no olive oil, nothing, just lettuce and cucumber and vinegar. And right. it's so tasteless and boring. Whereas, right. yeah, that had, adding some fat into your diet is helpful and keeps your woodshed open and powers you along. That is amazing because, I mean, I know more people are realizing that that diet that a lot of us were exposed to, like, the 80s and then the 90s, you know, they're realizing that that's not the thing. But when you're conditioned, right, it's like, that's mm. the only way I'm going to lose weight and, you know, oh, keep yeah, yourself yeah. together. So it's like refreshing to have that reminder. It's like, remember, like, that was a thing, you know, that we thought was the way to do, you know, or to manage ourselves. But we can move forward with this, you know, more evolved approach to, to eating and stuff. I love that. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I'm sure, again, I was a diet queen in my youth. I spent a lot of time on diets and went to Weight Watchers. And, and honestly, all Weight Watchers taught me was to eat processed diet food. Mm. I, I thought that's what you had to do. So, yeah, I ate a lot of processed diet food. Did, didn't help me. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's so funny that you bring that up because that was, like, I, like you said, that was the answer. Like, it was just like, yeah. these are the things that we're supposed to eat. And if I don't, then I won't get to the goal of whatever that goal is for myself. So that, yeah, yeah. It's, it's wild that we were in that whole frame, you know, mind frame. And now it's like completely yeah. erasing that and trying to move forward with actually eating real foods. Like you said, the whole foods, you know. 
Oh, absolutely. And undoing years and years of conditioning and diet culture. And again, you know, whilst I love talking about metabolic health, I also love talking about the mindset management and psychological health around weight loss. Because for lots of us, it was a toxic relationship with the scales, with our body, with food, guilt, shame, emotions, all of that. It, it, yeah, it all needs basically unlearning and relearning. And, you know, I love that you brought that up because I wanted to talk about, you know, obviously we're still talking through this whole thing of uh, menopause and perimenopause, postmenopause. Oh, what the, we haven't even talked about postmenopause really yet, but I want to talk about that. But before we kind of like go into that part, I wanted to just definitely segue into your program that you have, Real Life Medicine, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so Real Life Medicine, if you can share with us, like, <laughs> What like what you all are doing and like who you're helping and yeah take it away because I'm really excited uh, to hear about this. Ah, uh, thank you. Well, I work with another beautiful doctor called Dr. Mary, uh-huh. and um, yeah, the two of us run this program. And basically, uh, we help women who, again, I you know I often think I just help women like myself, but women who have done every diet under the sun, every mm. single cabbage soup diet, all of them, Noom, Israeli Army Dutch, you know, Scarsdale, Pritikin, all of them, Dukin, I did them all, Right, soup. Um, So help women who have done every diet under the sun who, you know, at the end of the day, I got to the point where I had metabolic, poor metabolic health despite being a doctor, like it was, Mm. and I just had sort of resigned myself to the fact that I'd just be wearing elastic waisted pants for the rest of my life. and. So it's women like that who have almost given up on themselves and then helping them get to the point where they can improve their health and I guess, you know, lose weight long term because that's the whole idea. A lot of people, like despite my decades of dieting, I got to the point where I was fatter than when I was pregnant. Mm. I was the heaviest I'd ever been and I was metabolically unwell. And I, the only way I knew to lose weight was to diet. And I didn't realize that you could do it a different way. And I didn't realize that you could nourish your body properly and uh, unlearn all of the, the toxic messaging around dieting. So, yeah, so we help women who are in that situation who want to lose weight, optimize their health without feeling miserable or deprived and change their relationship with food. And the whole point of doing this is, as I said earlier on, is so that you can live this wonderful, fabulous life with plenty of energy, feel good in your body, feel good in your mind, and just feel like you're nailing life. Mm. Like it's so, it is the biggest joy for me to see uh, and hear stories from people who have done our program or are in our membership and just go, oh, we're doing it. And I say to Mary, we're doing it, Mares, we're doing it. And so, yeah, I love it. I love it. And I love that because like you said before, it's like we were so conditioned at a time to rely on these programs like Weight Watchers. Jenny Craig was a big one, you know, when I yeah. was uh, in college. Like it was, you know, and so it's all these different, the South Beach, like, it, it, and and thinking that that was going to be sustainable. Yeah. Even though like, I think about it now, I was like, I think guess in hindsight, you, you realize it wasn't sustainable, but at the time it was just like, this is the only answer. Um, and so much anxiety around it. And so I love that you are providing a space for women to one, you know, kind of like unlearn these things and, and feel empowered yes. in, in whatever, you know, in their process and in their journey as it relates to their weight loss. That's beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And again, you know, it comes back to this thing. You don't need to be a stick to mm. be healthy. And we have this little phrase that we teach that we call our people. We call them hotties because they're healthy on the inside. So, you know, and this is, I think, weight loss is an inside job. You have Mm. to get your hormones right and you have to do it in a way that is going to support your body and all your hormones, including your female hormones and your metabolic hormones, long term. Because Mm. dieting and chronic or long time calorie restriction is actually harmful to our body. And it's really tricky because it's this allure, like, yeah, you can lose a few kilos or a few pounds quickly by cutting your calories, but you do it at the expense of your metabolic health and it comes back to bite you like it did for me, you know, in my 40s where suddenly I 
I couldn't lose weight like I used to. I got, yeah, you know, frumpy, grumpy and dumpy. And I thought this is just nuts. And now, you know, I did, I, I, I lost 20 kilos, which I think is about 45 pounds. Yeah. Five years ago, it's never come back on. I've That's never, crazy. I know, I know. And I used to just, yeah, it, it still kills me that I spent so long not knowing how my body worked, even though I was a doctor. It was sort of nuts. But anyway, I know now. So, yeah. And I love that because I love that you keep bringing up to this whole idea around metabolic health because I don't think people, and maybe, maybe I'm just not understanding, or maybe I just don't realize people know about this, but I think for what I know of the people I know, women I know, particularly the idea around metabolic health, like what is that? Right. Because, yeah. you know, it's one thing to, you know, say, oh, I don't want to, you know, eat too much, too many carbs or, you know, too much refined sugar or whatever. But overall metabolic health, what does that mean? And how does that play a part in weight loss and even menopause for that matter? Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's so interesting because as when I was a junior doctor, which was back in the 90s, mm-hmm. Metabolic syndrome didn't exist. In fact, we called it syndrome X because there was this weird constellation of things that were affecting a few people and we didn't kind of, we couldn't put them all together. Mm. And so, you know, particularly fatty liver disease started and in in my teaching, my learnings, fatty liver disease only occurred with excess alcohol. But what was happening was that people were coming up going, I don't drink. And, you know, the usual medical gaslighting community, we just didn't believe them. We thought, oh, right. you're a closet drinker. But right. then it started affecting children. And mm. that's when you go, okay, something's going on here. And so that became part of what was going on and recognising that the root cause of metabolic syndrome, so metabolic syndrome is a constellation of symptoms or of of conditions, I guess, which include fatty liver disease, um, but also high blood pressure and low, like altered lipids. So you'll get low HDL, which is, you know, classically called the good cholesterol. Uh, and you, you've got your weight around the middle. So, you know, in Australia, for blokes, we call that the beer belly. And, um, yeah, and women will call it their, their pot. They, go, they turn from pears into apples. Mm. And, um, and so the, the root cause of this, as I said, back to it, is, is actually high circulating insulin and insulin resistance, which means your cells are resistant um, to insulin and so the pancreas has to make more and more, more and more. And it's great, a great organ, another beautiful organ looking after us because if the pancreas doesn't, pump out all this insulin, then we develop type 2 diabetes. We get high blood glucose. And the problem that we have with metabolic syndrome is high blood glucose is is not good for our body. No cell loves too much glucose. Uh, It's toxic to our nerve cells, to our blood vessel cells. Uh, And insulin itself is also not a great hormone in excess. And it's harmful to our kidney cells, to our eyes, cells in our eyes. Mm -hmm. And it's why we, as I said, why we lock the shed and then we can't. We actually feel terrible in the moment. So it's current health. So I always talk about your current health and your future health. So current, you know, if you had insulin resistance, Alicia, current Alicia would be tired, run down, you know, blah. And then future Alicia is going to develop type 2 diabetes, chronic disease, Alzheimer's, hypertension, like the, a bazillion, a list as long as your arm. Right. So, yeah, so that's what, so, so that's metabolic health, metabolism. Everyone knows about the word metabolism and everyone right. wants a fast metabolism. So metabolism is the rate at which you're burning calories, lying around doing nothing. <laughs> Which, of course, we all want to do that. I mean, who wouldn't want to burn their calories lying around doing nothing? It's brilliant. Um, And that is the majority of where our energy goes. So, again, Dietland told us we have to do more exercise, but actually you burn the bulk of your calories lying around doing nothing. Wow. And insulin slows that down, as does losing your estrogen. So, uh, yeah, so insulin is... Again, it is the absolute critical hormone. So 
we want to be able to access our fuel. So I, I just basically describe metabolic health as the way in which you can access your fuel. Mm. And when you can access it properly, easily, then your body works really well. When you can't access it properly and easily, you develop symptoms and the symptoms are fatty liver disease or the symptom is you develop obesity. The, the Obesity is the symptom. It's not the cause. Mm. Okay, so people get all up in their head about, oh, my God, obesity is so terrible for you. It's actually the symptom of underlying things. And so then I go, okay, back to the, you know, I love to kind of peel off the onion layer and go, right, well, so this the cause of obesity then is we know it's hormonal, high circulating insulin makes it hard to get your fat stores. If you can't access your fat, then you need to eat all day. And people go, what do you mean? I go, well, back to the fireplace analogy, you don't have any logs. All you've got is kindling to fuel your fire. So if you're trying to heat your house with kindling, you're standing there all day putting bits of sticks on your on your um, fireplace. Right. So I think once one of, so that recommendation of eating six small meals a day doesn't help us, right. particularly because if they're very high carb, the problem with high carbs is our pancreas makes more insulin, locks the sheds more. So we get stuck in this cycle. Cycle, yeah. I know. It's awful. And we feel like we're just greedy and that hunger, you know, hunger is has now been weaponized as a moral failing. If you're hungry, you're greedy, you know, right. and, and off and hunger again, hunger's hormonal. It's driven by metabolic hormones. So ghrelin is another hormone. It drives our hunger. Right. So yeah, it's fascinating. It is absolutely fascinating. I am, and I'm like taking it all in. I'm like, this is, because um, this is like something that I, I love learning about, obviously as being yeah. a nurse mm. practitioner, but like, this is so intriguing to me because, and I, I'm pretty sure the listeners are probably thinking the same thing because especially when you brought up the whole idea around obesity, not being like, like this, you know, yeah. I forgot how you mentioned it, but you basically you're saying it's a symptom yeah. to the whole thing as opposed to it just being like, boom, this is the bad thing that you've done. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're a terrible person because you're right. you're greedy and you're lazy and this is the result of this greed and, you know, this sloth and gluttony is now you're just a, you know, boom bar. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's rubbish. It's really terrible and it's not, it's not at all that. It's, as I said, there's certainly hormones, there's... Uh, genetics as well and 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 people will go oh no it's not genetics because you know the we this has only happened in recent times but what they don't realize is that epigenetics plays a huge part in it mm. and so if you're a baby born to a mum who had gestational diabetes then your genetic your epigenetics mean that you are much more likely like a zillion times more likely to develop insulin resistance wow and so you see i mean and you can see it even in families you'll see kids who have the same upbringing the same diet one kid's skinny and one kid's not yeah. and that's genet that is genes so again doesn't mean it's hopeless and we can't do anything, but it does mean that we, you know, again, coming back to that limiting starches and sugars, you know, will be helpful. And again, it doesn't mean you can never have cake again. People go, does that mean I can never have cake? Of course. But it just means that you need to be really mindful of the effect of starches and sugars that will have on your body compared to somebody who doesn't have insulin resistance, who gets away with it for a bit longer. <laughs> right. Most people, it catches up to them, particularly menopause. <laughs> and that's what I was just about to ask you. At that time, when this starts happening, you know, what does that look like? I, obviously, we talked about, like, you know, the, the yeah. weight gain and the different things like that. So menopause kind of, like, brings it full circle for some people who might have, like you said, gotten away for it, from it yeah. for so many years. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah. Because you lose your estrogen, so suddenly you don't have that insulin uh, that protection against insulin resistance. So, yeah. yeah. So, no, it is. And, again, you know, I think that this is where stigma judgment around people who have heavier bodies is so unhelpful. Mm. And we think that by 
um, bullying them or shaming them into action that they would do something. But it's it's you've got to get to the root cause first, um, you know, and understanding the drivers for why people eat and what people eat and. Right. And again, I mean, and this is probably another whole episode on, right. on psychological drivers for eating because that's massive. And right. again, unpacking those and helping people rewrite their stories is so yeah. useful and helpful and a skill that they can take with them forever. Right. I, I'm just like saying thank you, thank you, thank you, because I have been someone who has struggled with my weight my whole life, which is why I even started this podcast, right? Right, yep. And to hear. And I know it's probably refreshing to other people too, but to hear a doctor say this in this way, because normally when I would go to the doctor in the past, it was always, if something was going on with me, I mean, it was like, oh, you just need to lose weight. And it was like, yeah. is it always the weight? Like, is it, yeah. I mean, I know weight can contribute to a lot of things, but can we talk about like something that would really help me in this whole process of weight loss as it relates to, you know, this, you know, maybe monitoring like my like you said the insulin resistance yeah. like what what is causing all these things like help me you know so you're just walking yeah. away feeling defeated so thank you for this sense of empowerment um uh, on a topic that normally you walk away feeling so shameful you know uh i know i know it's and that that line you just need to lose weight honestly if i had a dollar for every time i've heard someone had that say to them i'd i'd be a gazillionaire right and also the other one that i love is you know have you ever thought of losing weight? Are you serious? <laughs> Have you ever thought of it? I think about time. it every day. Yeah, every day, 100 times a day. Have I ever thought about it? Oh, I know. And so <laughs> You just opened my yeah. eyes. I, I never yeah, thought. Yeah. No. Oh, do you think? Do you think that would be a good idea? Oh, God. So, yeah. I oh, think, um, yeah. And again, coming back to that, getting metabolic hormones sorted, uh, and working out ways in which you can do it. I mean, that's the mm. whole thing. So knowing what to do. So first step is knowing what to do. So we do, you know, again, we have a three-step process because our brains don't like it when things are hard. When things seem yeah. big, it goes, oh, my God, that's too hard. That's too big. I'm just going to hide over here. Right. But if, you, if you've got a three-step process, and ours is all the strategies that you can do to improve this metabolic health. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it is. And, you know, things like sleep have a profound effect on metabolic health. So, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, cortisol levels have a profound effect. So how, getting strategies to improve that metabolic health uh, is step one. Step mm -hmm. two is mindset skills so that you can unlearn diet culture, get rid of perfectionism, you know, the all mm -hmm. or nothing. I used to describe my life as like... um. Like I felt like I was careering down the road of life. You know, I was driving a car on one side, so I'd be perfect on this really rigid diet. And I was pretty good at dieting, so I'd be perfect. And then I'd stop dieting and go on the other side and just go, oh, and eat all the things in the world. Ah, everything I've missed out on, I'm scoffing. Ah. And so this kind of careering down this crazy road. And now I'm in the middle and I feel like I've got lane assist you know and you know when yeah. you've got those cars with lane assist and they just yeah. you just do some little adjustments so you're in the middle you're not perfect but you're not on a bender you're eating well sometimes you just take a little deviation and that's okay because you can just bring yourself back to the middle and it's so so calm such a calm way to live your life you know there's no I don't have any of that crazy brain chatter that I'm sure you've had you know, will I eat it? Won't I eat it? Don't eat it. Yeah, eat it. Stop eating it. Oh my God, you're eating it. No, stop, stop. Like that. I can't stand it. Yeah, I've got that. I've got quiet, beautiful, quiet brain now. It doesn't do that. I love that. And you know, mm. as you were saying, just kind of like in the middle of it all, that yeah. is where I am at for the most part at this point in my life. And yeah. like you said, it's freeing. Like it's just it so freeing because that, that, you know, back and forth, you know, constantly almost like that. I, I don't know if you, the analogy of the good angel, bad angel type of thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I know. And it's almost like they, they are yelling, like you're just, it's like, you know, mum and dad fighting, you're just a kid in the middle. And it's like, oh, stop. Wow. But yeah. Let me live. Yeah, so I know. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It I is, wanted yes. to circle back to, back to the idea around menopause, because I know we talked yes. about like the whole idea of, once again, thank you, because I did not realize perimenopausal was actually what we see uh, yeah. as it relates to 
when people say they're going through menopause, which kind of makes a sense because people say I'm going through menopause. Yeah. So it's like you're going through it until it's actually at the you know end of everything. But postmenopausal women, for those women, what does that look like? And what are the things that postmenopausal women should be doing? Or I don't know if it's that should be doing, but like what are things that would um be beneficial for the postmenopausal women because they aren't producing as much estrogen or or, yeah. or, or really are they producing estrogen at that time? Yeah, so they are still producing some because the mm-hmm. adrenal gland doesn't stop. Right. So the and, and it's good. I'm glad you brought me back because the, I was talking about the four lifestyle things that you need to do, and they're uh-huh. the same. So it's whether it's peri or post, it is about reducing. Um, insulin levels. So again, just reducing your starches and sugars. We want to improve our sleep. So sleep is Mm. our superpower and good sleep reduces insulin and improves our cortisol levels. Mm. We want to manage our stress and people think that stress management is like most people's technique is to want to run away to a deserted island. That's their only technique. I don't know. And and they think, you know, I'll have people that come and say, yeah, but Lucy, I've just got a busy life. I can't change that. And it's not about changing the external stressors. It's about developing skills to manage them. So rather than calling it stress management, I call it stress management skills. Because right. when you've got the skills, you can manage it. When mm. you've got no skills, as I said, your only one is I just need to run away. I just need to stop the world. I just need to get off. So, yeah, so we've got uh, – and so then the fourth – I actually call these the S's, the four S's. So sustenance because that's the only word I could think of that sort of meant nutrition. Right. Sustenance, sleep, stress management skills, and strength training. Mm. So I mentioned earlier that estrogen is really involved in our muscles and – Muscle mass, the bigger our muscles, muscles are a metabolic organ. So what that means is the bigger our muscles, the less insulin resistance we have. Oh, wow. I know. So it all they all tie in together. Like this is why it's called the metabolic triad of insulin, estrogen, and um, cortisol. So when we have less muscle, which we will naturally get as we age, unless we take active steps to counter that, as we get less muscle, we get more insulin resistance. As we get less muscle, we become frailer, we fall over, we break bones. Right. Um, you know, again, it's you then, you know, you're, you're on a Zimmer frame and you can't do all the things you want to do. So building muscle is protective against your future for future you, but it's also helpful for current you because it reduces insulin resistance, helps you with your um you know, your energy levels and those sorts of things. So, yeah, that's the four steps. And when you, you know, the the more that you can do those, and sleep in particular, like I know some people have trouble sleeping, but for a lot of us, we don't even go to bed properly. Mm. Like I, I used to, and, and I, you know, and I'm sure lots of people do, you sit up, you don't want to go to bed. You're watching Netflix. You're thinking, you're binging. You're going, I've got to go to bed. No, I don't want to go to bed. Back to the angel. And part of the reason you don't want to go to bed is because the minute you go to sleep, it feels like it all starts again the next day, yes. back on the hamster wheel. I don't want to do that. And so you stay up because this is your one bit of time to yourself where you're looking after yourself. And so, and then you get to the point where you're almost too tired to go to bed and you just want someone to carry you there. And this goes on and on. And it's like hmm, humans are the only living creatures that voluntarily restrict their sleep. Wow. I know. And that's it. You don't see it. You know, cows aren't out in the paddock staying awake going, I wish I could go to sleep, you know. (laughs) Dogs, they're just sleeping. No, right. you know, humans, we're, we're, our, you know, we're watching Netflix even though our eyes are falling out of our head because right. we, don't want, we don't want to go to bed. Yeah. That fear of missing out too. It's just yeah. like I'm going to miss it. And it's like what is it? Like go yeah. to sleep. <laughs> yeah, go to sleep because you feel you, you set yourself up then for the day, the next day, mm. and you cope so much better. You, you know, you, again, hunger hormones go high when you're, when you reduce your threat, when your sleep's re- reduced, and there was a study on some college kids because 
that's what studies are done on, um, where they they voluntarily they they went into an, an experiment and they restricted their sleep to six hours a night, which I'm thinking, oh, that's not that bad, right? Um, and after a month, those kids developed insulin resistance. Wow. So we go, uh, we've just got to, you know, go the hell to sleep. <laughs> Moral of the story. Thanks for listening. Moral the hell to sleep. I love this. And I literally could talk to you all day, Dr. Lucy. This yes, has man. been amazing. And I hope that if you can, because honestly, y'all, because you know how I am, I reached out because I wanted to talk about Alzheimer's. But I was like, when I found out Dr. Lucy, like, like you know, specialized in menopause, I was like, oh, this mm. is something that we definitely need to talk about. So I hope that you can come back on at some point and maybe we can yeah. talk about Alzheimer's. Oh, that would yeah, be amazing. Absolutely. Do you know, can I just quickly finish with yeah. um, a, a couple, a, a, like a two-second discussion on MHT or HRT? So HRT, hormone replacement therapy, for uh, got such a bad rap for such a long time related to a study that was released 20 years ago, the Women's Health Initiative study, which suggested that women who took uh, or were using HRT had increased risk of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, mm -hmm. and breast cancer. Ah, that study has now been debunked and we also now have newer forms of MHT. So mm. it can be really useful for somebody. So I would always say lifestyle first, absolutely, sort your lifestyle out. Right. But let's say you're going to bed. Let's say you've, you've reduced your sugars and starches. Let's say you, you know, you're journaling or you're using some of our stress management techniques that we teach and you're still waking up at 3 o'clock sweating your head off. Mm. Um, no amount of journaling is going to fix that for you. So right. we, you can look at MHT if you don't have, as I said, if you haven't had estrogen dependent breast cancer. Right. We now know that topical or transdermal estrogen is now very safe. It doesn't go through the liver, so it doesn't cause any of the clotting issues, so it doesn't increase any of the issues with cardiovascular disease. You're not going to have a heart attack because you took you use an estrogen patch. Okay. We now also know that the progesterones that we now use, we now have access to a bioidentical micronized progesterone called and in Australia it's Prometrium is the brand. And it combined it it so the the cancer risk people still want to know about the cancer risk yeah so we know that if if you don't have a uterus you don't need progesterone you only have estrogen mm. if you're using transdermal estrogen interestingly you have a reduced breast cancer risk which people are going what that can't be right it is it wow. is right if you're using combined HRT and if you have a uterus, you have to take progesterone, otherwise you are at high risk of endometrial cancer, mm. then taking traditional progesterones did increase your risk of cancer, of breast cancer, slightly. Mm. Um, but if you take micronized progesterone or the bioidentical progesterone, that risk is markedly reduced. And just to put some numbers on it all, uh, the British Menopause Society has this great graphic, which I can send to you for you to share with your li listeners if you like. Yes. So they, the graphic is for women aged between 50 and 59, for every 1,000 women, 23 will develop breast cancer over a five-year period. That is just our baseline risk of cancer. Right. So 23 women. If you take combined MHT, the old-fashioned way, an extra eight women per thousand would get breast cancer mm. over that five-year period. If you take the bioidentical, that reduces to four. So it's four women, four extra women per thousand women every five years. Mm. If your BMI is over 30, and that's and there's, there's nothing to do with MHT now. This is just a baseline risk of breast cancer. If your BMI is over 30, an extra 24 women every for every 1,000, every five years will get breast cancer. Wow. So this is where I'm saying that 
under 30, BMI under 30, I kind of go, yeah, that's you, most people are still pretty healthy then. Over 30, you actually double your breast cancer risk just from that. And the driver of that breast cancer risk is going to, <laughs> comes back to insulin. It will be insulin, mm. which is a growth hormone and drives cancers. And also, um, yeah, just excessive, un- unfortunately, excessive stored body fat does have some uh, cancer risk. And the majority of it is driven by insulin. So this is where I say to women, you know, if if we can, again, it's not about losing weight just for losing weight. And it's not about losing weight by dieting, but it is about making changes that make your body healthier. Weight loss will come along for the ride. You don't have to focus on that. You focus on doing the activities, reducing your sugars and starches, managing your stress, building your um, strength and going to bed and you'll just lose weight. It'll just happen. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That is, thank you so much. Because like I, like for me to know that all this is possible in such a simple way, way yeah i think we were just kind of like making things so complicated in the past Uh, everything had to be like you know all hmm. these all these different steps and you must do this and it's just like no it it's yeah pretty simple how Uh, you can lay all this out absolutely plus we just told people to calorie restrict which made them hungry and you know hunger again not a moral failing it is a physiological process and at the end of the day hunger wins because mm. humans, hunger was there to keep us alive. Right. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's crazy. But anyway, I know. So I, I just am so happy when people can finally ditch dieting, embrace yeah. things that are healthy for them, um, you know, learn learn about their bodies in a way that is easy. You know, you don't need to go and do a medical degree. And, in fact, it didn't help me that much anyway. Um, <laughs> I learned about it once I'd finished. Um, but right. now that I know, I and I, now I make decisions for my health based on knowledge rather than just, you know, again, something else. Right. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Dr. Lucy, once again, thank you so, so oh, much. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome, Alicia. Seriously. Thank you for having me. Of course. And if you could let everyone know where they can follow you with any social media platforms, websites, yeah, take it away. Yeah, absolutely. So real life medicine is our, you know, thing. So, and again, part of this is because we are real, like Mary and I, if we're on socials, I'm not fancy. I'm not an influencer in my tiny bikini. I'm turning <laughs> up in my dressing gown straight out of the shower or something. Um, so yeah, real life medicine on all the socials, rlmedicine.com is our website. And I will um, send you a link because we have got a, a free ebook, which is just, oh, awesome. again, yeah, goes through this uh, insulin hoo-ha because it's got a lot to take in. So mm. people can uh, just sign up to that uh, ebook and I'll, and I'll send it to them. So I'll send oh, you the link for that. That is awesome. Thank you so much again. This was You're welcome. awesome. Seriously. Oh, good. Oh, I'm so happy. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and y'all, thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Eat Me podcast. I'll see y'all next week. Thank you. Oh, 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 oh,